Hello and welcome to Common Ground, an inside look at Suffolk County. I'm your host, Sheriff Steve Tompkins. Now listen, today's guest, oh my goodness gracious, this is, first of all, just a fantastic human being, a wonderful lady, and a very astute public servant, and that would be our treasurer, uh, Deb Goldberg. And she's the best, and she's going to talk to us today, not only about her job and what it means to make sure that uh, the Commonwealth's money is really being invested properly and that all the services that you and I and all of the citizens of the Commonwealth are getting. Um, but she's going to talk about how much she loves to dance when Bill Lenahan, the <laughs> city council president, <laughs> is playing music. That's an inside joke. But if you ever see a city council, Boston City Council President Bill Lenahan, ask him about Jailhouse Rock. He'll tell you about it. Hey, thank you so much, <laughs> oh, Madam sure. Treasurer, so for coming nice on to today. Be with you. It's great. It's great to have you here today. Let's start with the job in and of itself. Tell folks out there that may not understand the full nuances of what the, the treasurer does. Well, you know, it's funny because most people hear treasurer and they just think money. And in Massachusetts, we actually have a treasurer's office that has so many responsibilities with so uh, that are so not even interrelated. Mm -hmm. It goes from, yes, cash and debt management mm -hmm. and investing our money and taking care of the pension fund to the Mass School Building Authority, the lottery, the Alcoholic Beverage Commission. So um, the treasurer not only needs a background in finance, mm -hmm. but also a background in how you manage different business, different businesses. I mean, unclaimed properties. Right. And of course, I wouldn't want to um, slight the Office of Economic Empowerment, which holds all of the public policy programs, financial literacy, wage equality, um, empowerment programs, yeah. and the like. So it's, it's a, a I think it is one of the most exciting jobs in state government, and I'm loving every minute of it, just every single minute. Well, I mean, I had no idea, frankly, and I'm inside government, I didn't realize it was that big, that it had that many moving parts. Now, now almost 800 employees. How do you, now, now I was gonna say, how do you marshal all of that? I mean, I'm sure you must have an executive a team, a staff that uh, you surrounded yourself with. Talk to us about how you, on a day in, day out basis, manage all of those different moving parts. Well, I have to say that, um, particularly my background, which was, which is rather unique. You know, I grew up in what was once upon a time a small family business okay. where my mother's great grandmother opened a little teeny store mm -hmm. and um, it was all about making sure everybody had a job and right. a roof over their heads right. and it grew into a big supermarket chain, mm -hmm. Stop and Shop. Yes, yes, but very it wasn't, big, right. Which we unfortunately went through a hostile takeover. We wouldn't oh. fire our folks and so we were fired. I see. But that's, that's, a, that's a old story. Yeah. But I was brought up to run this business and it had Stop and Shop, Bradley's, Medimart, the manufacturing companies. Oh, wow. And so the kind of skills that you need to be able to shift from one type of business to the next right. was something that I was being taught even when I was um, a young kid. Yeah. And then of course um, I went to Harvard Business School and I went right. to BC Law School and learned a lot of the sophisticated things that you need to know in terms of investing and and uh, debt and cash, yeah. but also I feel that I really learned a lot being chairman of the board of selectmen right around the corner in Brookline. Oh, okay. Um, worked on the pension fund okay. there. Had to licensed um, restaurants with liquor licenses, right, right. and so and and recognize how to apply my practical experience and my education in the public sector. I have found that really applies to the treasurer's office. Mm -hmm. I can go from a meeting in the morning of the State Lottery Commission and talk about advertising, promotion, how you compete in a more competitive environment, right to discussing how we're going, what kind of bonds we're going to issue, mm -hmm. what are the revenue streams that are going to support that bonding, what are the interest rates, do we have a refunding opportunity to bondholders which saves the uh, saves the state, we just did one last week, we saved the state $73 million nice, nice. over the lifetime of the bonds. So now, I can do that, now, it's so, really so, exciting. So let me, let me stop you there because we often talk to kids about their future. You know, right. we, I'm sure you do, I do, I go into schools often, we talk about you know, what your future holds, although you don't know where your future is going to take you. What I often say to kids is, you may be 14 or 15 or 16 now, but in the blink of an eye, you're gonna be 27, 37, 47. Yes. 
And so you need to prepare yourself. My question to you, when you were coming up in that family business, did you always have a desire to work in the public sector and do what you're doing now, or did you, you grow into wanting well, to do that? Well, when I was a kid, um, the treasurer was Bob Crane, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. who, was a, who was a legend at yes, the time. I Bob. Would I have ever imagined myself in his job? I don't think so. Right. But I think that when you're a kid, what you do is I, education is the key. That's right. And experience. You know, I started, you know, I mean, you may not have to have a job, right. but you should have a job. Whether it's beginning babysitting right. when you're really young right. to a part time job when you're in high school. I always worked, and I think that practical experience is really, really important. Right. That you begin to see, you know, some kids will say, well, why do I need to know that? And because they don't see where it applies later mm -hmm. on in life. Mm -hmm. And I think if you have a job, you begin to see that you're being taught to think, you're being taught to, um, to read and interpret. Right. So you may not be reading about the Civil War and interpreting what all right. that meant, right. but if you look out today and you think about what's going on right. in the rest of the world, you know how to think it through right. and work on those issues. Right. And I think that that's what I would recommend to kids. One of the reasons I'm very focused on financial literacy and the affordability of college or technical training is I feel it's really important that we give, starting at a very young age, kids the skills to understand how to survive right. in this very challenging world. Mm -hmm. From a financial point of view, it's very expensive to live in Massachusetts. It's very expensive to get technical training or to go to college. And so we're doing programs, including a college savings plan mm. for kids on the free lunch or subsidized lunch nice, program. Nice. and so that we can help prepare kids. And we're using that savings program to teach financial literacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's good interest, right. what's bad interest, right, exactly. those kind of things. In fact, we're teaching financial literacy at the Sheriff's Department I to the inmate population because I agree with you. It really is important that people know how to. And they have to. their own unique set oh, of absolutely. issues. Absolutely. You know, we're doing it with veterans coming home from overseas. Right. There's another set of unique issues. Right, right. So now, you didn't know that you wanted to replace Bob uh, <laughs> Crane or actually walk in those shoes at some point. So tell us, when did that change? Well, I will tell you that um, we were always politically active. Your my family. My family. Right. Um, because we had a business that impacted so many people's right. lives in Massachusetts, right. we engaged in our communities from going way, way back. But my dad, in the um, early, late 50s, early 60s, ran for local office in Brookline. He was Matter a town fact. meeting okay. member. Okay. Then he ran townwide. I, at seven years old, was Michael Dukakis's mascot, and it wasn't for president, it yeah. wasn't even for governor, it was, uh, state representative, 1961-62. You know, in fact, I didn't know that he... I'm state sorry, representative I, from I had, Brookline. I didn't know that. Door to door, precinct to precinct, you know, block you? to block, street to street, Are precinct. He's saying it in the 60s, he's oh saying it now. God. So um, I understood that we needed you know, just inherently, yeah. um, even though the same way I understood about working and our people and that we were, our role at Stop and Shop was to create economic stability for people, mm -hmm. I understood that we, every area of your community you needed to be a part of, right. that that was who we were, that right. was who I was. Right. And so I was a, I just was an activist, I was always engaged. Um, I'll tell you, my dad ran town wide. I stood at my poor school friends. I made every one of them take home a calendar <laughs> with his picture on it. Right. And Jeffrey Wax w drew a, a mustache and horns on him, and I cried. Oh. <laughs> Jeffrey, I'd like to ask whatever happened to Jeff, but we'll He's leave that around. alone. Is he still around? He's huh? done reunions yeah. from the Rumble oh, no School. Kidding. Yes. Wow. So, but in terms of myself, when Stop and Shop went through a takeover, mm -hmm. um, it was my mom who said. Uh, what do you want to do? And I said, public service. And she said, pick three women and go talk mm. with them and see which area. So I had breakfast with State Senator Lois Pines. Yep. And when yep. she was done with me, she said, run for office. I went to lunch with former Lieutenant Governor Evelyn Murphy. Oh, yeah. When she yes. was done with me, she yeah. said, run for office. Right. 
I never made it to dinner with Marion Hurd or I would have been at the oh, United Way. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. She's been and I ran too. for town meeting. Right. And then I ran for selectman. Okay. And th I just became more and more active. And, um, you know, I'm a state committee woman. And yeah. Now I'm the state treasurer. Did I imagine that? Not necessarily. But when people came to me and said, you really should look at this. Right. I sat down and looked at all the things that the treasurer does right. and I said this is an opportunity to make a meaningful difference in people's lives and yeah. I couldn't walk away from it and I'm glad I didn't. Well you know it's interesting so years ago I, I created a program where I send officers into schools middle school high school to talk to kids principally about for two reasons one because I wanted a child to have an interaction with a, an adult in a uniform when they weren't in trouble right. and then two to talk to them about public safety when we got there we found that some of the schools no longer had or offered civics and so we asked if we could create a civics curriculum um, and they said yes and so now when the officers go and they talk about civics and I think it's highly important that our youth understand how government and, and, and communities work together, the power of the vote. Talk to me about civics because you're, you're obviously very civically inclined. How important is it that all of our youth really gets exposed to that and understand what civics is about? Well, that's one of the things that I really pushed on the local level, in particular with groups that stay in the shadows. Mm -hmm. um, for example, in Brookline, we have an enormous Asian population. Okay. And uh, there was a tendency not to get involved, to work hard, to study. Um, I wanted to bring more and more Asians into jobs in the town, that we needed police officers, we needed teachers, as an example of a way to push a community to understand that what's going on out there right. impacts your life, right. the choices that you get. So I think um, it's really critical from the very beginning that young kids understand the the possibilities and what affects them. Mm -hmm. You know, I used to even say to my own friends, um, you pay taxes here in Brookline. Um, it's a pretty big bill that you get. Right. How often do you get a bill like that and you don't know what it's for? Yeah. So you need to pay attention to what is going on here. Right. What are you getting the education that you are wanting to pay, that you're paying for? Mm -hmm. Are your streets getting plowed the mm -hmm. way you want mm -hmm. them to? Right. And if they're not, you need to run for town meeting. Mm -hmm. You need to be on a commission or a board. You need to get involved. And I've done it one-to-one. -one. I've done it on a statewide level, as you know. But the other thing is, is that through my mentoring programs that we are doing in the treasurer's office, whether that. it's um, in supporting young women, in looking at the STEM fields and in finance, um, why are Science, we doing technology. that? But we're teaching kids financial literacy, empowerment, um, engagement, why doing these things are important. And that's what's so great about the treasurer's office. Even when I'm not involved in my empowerment programs, I sit as a woman mm -hmm. at the head of the table, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, at the pension fund. The majority of the people in that room are men, mm -hmm. and they're mostly white men. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, my, my first appointee to the pension fund was a woman of color, mm -hmm. someone you know, Ruth Ellen Fitch. Oh, yeah. First yeah. African-American yes. woman yeah. who was a partner in yeah. a downtown That's right. law firm. That's right. And Bond then what attorney. did she do? That's right. She came along after she retired and ran the Dimmick That's Center right. That's down right. the street. Yep. She is my appointee to the pension fund. I did fund. not know that. So when you have Ruth Ellen and me, oh and we are talking about emerging managers yeah. and programs yeah. Yeah. and the kind of people we want to see engage, and we pass proxy voting guidelines, which we did this year, that mm -hmm. say we will not vote for a company, meaning a company that we invest in mm -hmm. that doesn't have 25% women and minorities on their boards we don't vote for you. Now you know what, I bet you a lot of people don't know that one, you do that, or that the treasurer's office would even be interested in that. That's not part of your per your mandate, but is that something that you want to bring to the Commonwealth through well, that I'm office? Not, and I'm not the first treasurer to be thinking about that. Okay. In fact, there's a wonderful consulting firm that, that actually performs the voting for a lot of the pension funds. Okay. And I w have been working with them. We may be leading on the level right. um, under Treasurer Grossman 
He had a policy that he did not vote for a company if they didn't have a woman or a minority. Okay. Well, I said, hey, you could be one and done. You get a woman of color, you're done. Right, That's right, not good enough right, for me. Gotcha. So I said, no, we have to push it much harder. We need to create aspiration mm -hmm. for companies, not because it's a good social policy, which it is, but because these businesses are not being competitive if they're not reflecting right. their customer base. Right, right. If they're a bunch of one kind of person sitting in a room talking to each other, they're not a progressive company that's mm -hmm. getting out there and mm -hmm. being competitive. We learned at Stop and Shop, in order to be competitive, you need to be on the cutting edge of where the world is. You want to be and leaders. You, and yeah. not only in terms of your customers, right. but your employees. If you're cutting yourself off from a huge talent pool, you're not creating the most competitive company you can. Right. And so it's, it's good business sense, and it's good. So let me ask you this. Okay, so you've talked about a lot about empowering women. How does it feel to be, you say you're in this room with a lot of guys, and I know you well, so I know you've got hooks. I'm very shy. You've got mocks. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. And the moon is made out of cheese. So how does it Cannon feel? <laughs> how about that? How does it feel to actually be in that chair to say, look, this is how we're going to come together and work collaboratively, and gender aside, just the ability to say we can make something important and significant happen. How does that make you feel? Well, it makes me feel great. Well, it makes me feel great and it makes me feel even greater. I want to share a story. Mm -hmm. Because I have to tell you, plenty of men want to do the right thing. And sometimes we get so busy in our lives, you don't think about it. So I think the um, paid parental leave that I instituted at Treasury right, right, three right, weeks ago, right. effective immediately. Right, right. Um, Prim, and I'm, a, I'm the chairman of that board, that's the pension fund, mm -hmm. I can't automatically change a, a policy there, but when they saw we were doing this, they were thinking about a paid parental leave, and theirs was going to be a little bit more limited, but when they heard what I was doing, they came right in and did it with me. And that felt good, right. but when it felt great right. was at the end of the meeting, two young women and one young man walked up to me and they all said, you are making a difference right. in my family's right. life. Right. Right. That's when it feels that's, yeah, great. That, yeah, and that's what public service is right. all about, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's interesting. I remember at the convention when you were running for office yes. and the speech that you gave and the video that you showed, I went up to Roger Lau, good friend good of friend ours. Good friend of both of ours. Yep. Works for Elizabeth and, Warren. Yeah, and I said to, uh, I said to Roger, because Roger and Roger and I were, are very good friends, and he said, "Look, you got to work with Deb. You got to work with Deb. You got to work with Deb." And I said, "I'm coming. I'm coming, but I'm not there yet. But I'm coming, Roger." And I, I heard what you had to say, and I saw your video, and I walked up to Roger. You're gonna ask him, and I said, "What do you need? Whatever, whatever resources that I have, it's all for Deb." Thank I was you. just really impressed with the way that you were able to, not only articulate your message. But then you were also able to pull that audience, and you remember it was an unwieldy audience there. Pull them close. Do you remember how long they had to wait? Oh, please. Don't even. <laughs> Tito, please. poor mm. Tito Jackson. Mm. Pete, you know he was he, Yes, he introduced me. you. That's and right. And he was supposed to be at the Pride Parade. Yeah. And we promised yeah. him he'd be there on time. Yeah. And we were, you know what it's like when you have, like, you're circling. It's like you're on the hunt. <laughs> the two of us. Yeah. An hour and a half waiting yeah. to go on. No wonder I came singing out on t and dancing onto the stage, if you remember. I do, I do, <laughs> I do. But I, th I thought you were, I thought you were very good uh, at at delivering that message. And I said, that's my treasure. That's the person who is really going to look out for the Commonwealth's interests. Now, once you got there, did you? What were the surprises? What did you encounter that you hadn't expected? Was there anything that you said, "Oh my, I didn't expect that." Let me think. Uh, I think that, well, it's, a, it's kind of amusing, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm Deb. Mm -hmm. You call me Deb. Yep. Uh, in our business, my grandfather was Mr. Sidney. <laughs> yeah. My mother was Carol. Yeah. My father was Av. Yeah. Um, I could be in a warehouse with the Teamsters. Yeah. And they, well, they actually used to call me Debbie, which shows how far back yeah, we go. Right, right. Um, or, the, or the clerks, the UFCW folks. Because, you know, I was a member of the union. 
Uh, the day before I was sworn in, um, First Deputy Jim McDonald, who I've known for good guy. 10 years. Yeah, I know Jimmy. Yeah, good guy. Jim says to me, now you know, I went to hug him goodbye and say, I'll see you tomorrow, because you know I hug too. That's right. And uh, he said to me, now listen, I have to tell you something. And I said, what? And he said, starting tomorrow, I will never call you Deb again. Right. And I went, what do you mean? Right. He said, you're a treasurer. That's right. And you won't hug me. That's right. And I will tell you, for the first month or maybe even longer, it felt isolating to me right. because I'm used to being so down to earth right. and normal. That's right. right. And that's what, right. and um, so the protocols, the dynamic, um, the dance, the, not the dance, but you know, really the um, serious nature yeah. of uh, the building yeah. and um, how you do all of that. Yeah. That's what I wasn't used to. Yeah, yeah. I also wasn't used to the level of scrutiny of the press um, yes. and the degree that they, um, the way that they interpret things and how you need to be sensitive to yeah, that. Right. You know, I'm a straight shooter. I'm used to saying what I think. Uh, I'm used to, I'm a doer too. Yeah. So I, if you, I make a decision to do something, you just, you know, you do it. Yeah. Uh, the great thing about the treasurer's office, because it really is an executive function, for the most part, for example, with paid parental leave, I was able to do it. So that's good. Right. But also being sensitive to how the legislature works, yeah. how the governor works, how yeah. we all work together. Right. Right. Um, I think that that, if you've never served in the building, and I don't, you haven't. I haven't served in the building, but I've spent a lot of time right. in the building. Yes. So you've seen oh, how, yes. and it's different. Oh, yeah. It yeah. is different. Yeah, it is. But the most profound thing was treasurer. Now I come home, and if my husband doesn't call me Madam Treasurer, he's in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I love it. I love it. Listen, we're, we're just out, just about out of time. We have to have you back because there's so many things that we did not talk about with the job. But I'm really happy for you. Thank you. I think that you're doing a great job. I've heard nothing but superlatives about oh, who you are you. and what you do, thank you know. You. And before we close, and I think this is an important message for folks in our audience to hear, but particularly uh, our youth. So you ran for office a couple of times. Mm -hmm. You won some, you lost some. Talk to us about losing, getting up, dusting yourself off, and then going back and doing it again. So let me tell you, um, there are some people who you look at them and you think to yourself as you're in high school, um, nothing ever bad ever happens to them, mm -hmm. and it always happens to me. Mm -hmm. Or look at how that person, you know, gets the job, gets the grades, gets into the school, mm -hmm. um, and I work at, as hard as they do, and it doesn't happen for me. So um, I used to have stumbling like that. Right. And one day, you know, something was kind of, was a tough break for me, and I called my dad, and my dad said to me, you know, your mom, that's how things went for your mom. I, he says, I was the golden haired kid. I went mm -hmm. to Boston Latin School. Mm -hmm. I was number one in my class. I got into Harvard, Harvard Law School. Your mom really had to persevere. Now, ultimately, my mother was one of the top 10 businesswomen in America. Right. And what I learned from her, there, were, there was a picture of a cat hanging onto the, a branch by its nails, mm -hmm. and it says, never give up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what I particularly tell people and young people is persevere. Yeah. Hold on to your dreams. Don't let people get in your way. Sometimes you win by losing. Right. I ran for lieutenant governor in 2006. This is a better job for right. me. Right. Right. This uses everything I know, right. all my that? life experiences, and the opportunity to directly impact How people's about lives. How about that? So I, I think you it's hard when you're a kid yeah. and you fall down. It's yeah. really hard to pick yourself up. But hold on to your dreams. Don't let other people make decisions for you. And that kid that was such a superstar and so talented, go look at them 30 years right, later. Right, right, You're, exactly. It, they may not be there. Right. So um, oh, that's, that, that's the message that that's I want to get out there. That's a powerful message. Madam Treasurer, thank you so much for coming on today, and we'd love to have you back again sometime soon. And you are soon. my sheriff. And you're my treasurer. Thank you, ma'am. It's mm -hmm. been a pleasure. Okay. Good to be with you. All right, folks, look, uh, we're going to a break. Uh, please do stay tuned. So if you've got to go and get that soda pop, get it quick and come right back. We'll Sugar-free, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mom. <laughs> there you go. See you soon.